Okay, welcome to our 11 o'clock session on proportional representation. It's going to be a big, healthy debate. So when we get the chance to open to the floor, please come forward, tell us what you think, ask the panel questions. Like We want to keep it comradely, of course, but like get involved, please. So my name is Sasha. I'm one of the steering group members of the World Transform Festival. Um, to my left, we have Laura Parker. Is part now of the Labour for a New Democracy, and I know her previously as Momentum's National Coordinator. Welcome back. Hi, hi. We have <laughs> Jake Rubin, Assistant Secretary of the Campaign for Labour Democracy, and Sasha Gupta is Labour Party and Momentum activist. Yeah. We're still waiting for one panelist, but we're going to start, and I'm sure he'll join us when he arrives. We're going to start with you, Laura. Brilliant. Hi, morning. I mean, who thought you'd come to a bloody electoral reform discussion on a Sunday morning? <laughs> this is like torture. More for you than me. Um, I've not seen any, this many people since COVID, never mind spoken to this many people. So I'm going to have notes and it's going to be very rusty. But we are amongst friends, despite the CLPD leaflet <laughs> this morning. I'd just like to make it clear that I'm not a fan of anyone other than Bruce Springsteen. There's a little bit at the end of that that suggests otherwise. But it's brilliant to be here, and it's really good that you guys have organized the debate. It's brilliant that CLPD are here, because in a year talking to people up and down the country about PR, you're the only people we found who will actually defend the status quo. So it is really good that you have decided to take that task on, because in the rest of the party, where we know the vast majority of members supports PR, a very small minority who don't, this is the Labour Party, I know you're not all in it, um, very rarely come forward to make the case. What's the case? Well, the case is that the Tories have got no better friend than the electoral system. All of us who campaigned for Corbyn, heart, soul, energy, blood, sweat and tears, and lots of tears after 2019, we know how close we came in 2017 to what would have been a historic election. We would have transformed the country. And, I mean, it really does make us cry when we think about the opportunity that we lost. And why did we lose it? We lost it because of right-wing media, from the moment that Corbyn was selected, never mind elected, attacked him. We lost because the city of London spread rumours and lies about the economic collapse that would follow whilst they were funding the Tories. And then we lost because in 2017, despite gaining 3.6 million votes, that translated into a mere 30 seats. Now, we're not going to do loads of maths today because the brilliant thing about TWT is the politics. But the maths behind that are that this electoral system supports Tory rule. And it is supporting it increasingly as the demographics of the country change. Some of you will know in the seats that you live that you can weigh votes for the Labour Party. I, for most of my life, have lived in seats where my vote never counted. Didn't mean I didn't get a Labour MP. I did in some cases, although... Kate Hoey is questionable whether she's Labour or not. <laughs> and in fact, God almighty, I'd have taken pretty much anybody other than Kate Hoey. But you could stack the votes up. Dan Carden, it's like North Korea in Liverpool, Walt, and he got 87% at the last election. The vast majority of those people might as well not have bothered getting out of bed because their votes did not count in this system. Meanwhile, the Tory vote is much more efficiently distributed across the country. So you're getting Tories elected with 35, 36% of the vote. And the way that the electoral system functions means that when it comes to election time, we, who are supposed to be in the Labour Party or on the left more generally, the party of the many, are chasing after the few in a small number of marginal seats because they're the only voters that count. So what happens? I mean, those of you my age and older will remember Mondeo Man, yeah? That mythical creature of the 90s. This was the basically middle-of-the-road guy who was going to ha make it happen for Labour. We had Workington Man at the last election. These are these white, generally, middle-aged and older, often quite wealthy retirees, homeowners, in those small number of seats that if you've got a vote, you can change the election result. What does that mean? It means that we are effectively shutting out of the system huge numbers of other people. Who are the people we're shutting out? The people we're supposed to care about the most. So momentum, only 25% of the seats that were up in the last election, 2019, could momentum send people to through the My Nearest Marginal campaign map. 
You as campaigners will know that you're being bussed around the country to go and canvass in places miles away from home. You're not talking to anyone that you work with. You're not talking to anyone that you live with. You've been shipped across to some marginal to try to persuade those small number of voters who will make the difference. I wanted to be in Wandsworth. I don't want to talk to Mondeo man at the other end of the country. I want to talk to Wandsworth woman, the black single mother who's being screwed by the renters and the landlords, who's been underpaid by her private company and whose vote doesn't count. So not only do we not talk to her in the campaign, we don't try to represent her much either. And this is the big thing for the left. This electoral system doesn't just mean that we can hardly get elected. It shifts everything about our politics. It drags our politics to the right. I live in Italy. My husband's Italian. I've been there over the last year and a half. And I'm staggered to see that the things that we thought were radical are just absolutely bog standard. When I rock up to the train station to take the journey, which is like the Gatwick Express, I buy the ticket there and then. There's only one price. It's a third of the price of the bloody Gatwick Express. And it also runs on time. Why? Because it's owned by the state. So that radical idea we had of nationalizing the railways, that's just how it is on the continent. And every single country in Europe, bar one, has got a PR system. All the Scandinavian countries with much less low levels of inequality, all the people who've not had to privatize every single last thing in the country, the people who took action on climate change quicker. Who's in our club? The club that some on the left want to defend? Us and Belarus. I mean, honestly, at what point are we going to understand that without democracy, the socialism project fails, and with this system, we, we will have neither? It is biased against us. It forces us to campaign for a minority of people. And if there's nothing else I've said that convinces you about why, we must all oppose first past the post. At the moment, the Tories, who are introducing voter ID, who want to suppress votes, who through the elections bill are going to get rid of the election commission, who prorogued parliament to shut down debate, who've abandoned scrutiny of most legislation. You know what they snuck into the elections bill last week? That they would like to extend first past the post. Mrs. Thatcher once said, I never thought I'd quote her at a TWT meeting. Mrs. Thatcher once said, we can't let the Labour Party win because they might change the voting system. If Thatcher wants it and Johnson wants it, hey people, how can we possibly want it? So I'm really looking forward to hearing how you're going to defend the system that we've got. And then it's brilliant so many of you are here and really looking forward to questions as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So that's a pro then, I take it. <laughs> okay, Jake. Is this working? Hi everyone, thanks for coming to the event. Um, as, as introduced, my name is Jake Rubin and I'm assistant, an Assistant Secretary of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. Um, and we've had a long-standing policy in favour of first past the post to achieve a majority Labour government. So I'm going to outline some of those arguments today. Uh, I'm going to look so at some of the arguments against PR in the abstract, but of course politics doesn't happen in the abstract. So I'm also going to look at who would benefit from PR. And also I'm finally going to, con going to consider how we'd even get there if we wanted it. I've been watching the uh, Danish political drama Borgen recently. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but um, the program starts with the shock advance of a centrist political party in Denmark under their proportional representation system. And after hours of negotiating with other parties, and despite not being the largest party in the parliament, they assemble a centrist coalition government of moderates and greens, shafting the left party in the process. And I was quite struck watching this all play out because the proponents of proportional representation always herald it as a kind of democratic system in which the voters, not politicians, have the power. But actually the opposite is the true, because by its very nature, PR actually puts more power into the hands of politicians and a small amount of politicians to negotiate out the platform that they were elected on. So when voters go to the polls under PR, they get a wider choice of candidates. I'm happy to concede that. But what happens after that? Very often, a small party gets to wield a large and disproportionate leverage over the government, far, far beyond its actual support in the country. And the party leaders, not party members, not voters, negotiate out the program they were elected on and cobble together a backroom deal to assemble a government. So they actually go to the public with one set of policies, 
and then the government that is actually produced has got a completely different set of policies. So the myth that it's more democratic as a system needs to be challenged. There are profoundly anti-democratic elements of PR. So I'll now look at the political conditions that are facing us in this country. Because politics doesn't happen in the abstract. So I think it's important to, to consider some of those things. So what, what are they, what, what's facing us? So we have a revanchist Tory party, which is whipping up a racist fervor and cultural war against migrants and LGBT people. A media landscape, which is essentially a propaganda piece for the Tories. A fairly weak workers, move it, workers movement, let's face it. And the defeat of Corbynism, the defeat of the left and the Labour Party. The idea that this, these are favorable conditions for the left on a new voting system is sorely mistaken. The balance of forces, both in the state and in civil society, are heavily stacked against the left. And instead, the real beneficiaries of the change in voting system is likely to be the far right, who naturally do well out of proportional systems anyway. So far from packing the parliament with socialists, it would actually, at this stage, be packing it with fascists and racists who would be given airtime and resources to pursue their disgusting agenda. So the benefit of first past the post is that it successfully locks the far right out of parliamentary representation. I'm not saying it locks them out of politics in general, but it locks them out of parliamentary representation, and the left should not take that lightly. And finally, then, I want to just, I want to just consider, even if we did agree that PR was a good thing, how would we actually get there? So there are two ways, as I can see it. So the first way is that Labour wins an election on first past the post and then nukes itself by changing the voting system to benefit its opponents and scuppers its own chances of implementing a radical manifesto that it was elected on. And then there's another, the other likely thing that could happen, which is, well, the more likely proposal, which is uh, proposed by some in the Labour Party, which is that Labour goes into an election with an electoral pact with the SNP, the Greens and the Lib Dems, and they say to the public, the most important thing facing this country is not the climate crisis, it's not poverty, it's not the pandemic, but it's actually the voting system. And I think the great majority of voters who are struggling under Tory rule would think we had an absolutely warped set of priorities. So I'm just gonna conclude. Supporters of PR, in my opinion, present it as a quick fix solution to solve our political problems. Whereas it would actually make the left weaker in this country and embolden the far right. And that's even before we think about how we'd get there. Instead, the left should focus on policies improving on, that are aimed at improving working class people's lives and campaign to defeat Tory role, rule on a transformative program for real change. Changing the voting system is a distraction from this priority. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Sasha. Hello. Morning, everyone. Uh, I was hoping to go after Howard Beckett, but here I am. <laughs> He's on his way. <laughs> He's on his way. He can go after me. Um, so this might come as a bit of a surprise to everyone, but I actually agree that electoral reform in this country does need to happen. Our electro electoral system is archaic. It is rigid. However, introducing votes at 16, devolving powers to local government is more in keeping with the values of radical social democracy and more achievable, less objectionable to the British public. They already have votes at 16 on the Isle of Man. They're going to trial it in Wales. Devolved local government uh, would create a more strength in the union and maintain Scotland and Wales as part of the UK. That's a far more effective way of achieving a Labour government than entering a coalition with the Lib Dems. We all know someone who desperately needs a Labour government, and not just a Labour government that would tinker around the edges and manage capitalism, but in order for that person to turn up at the polling booth after an exhausting day of work and be bothered to put X in the Labour Party box, we need to offer them something to hope for. My best friend Claire is that person. Claire's an NHS worker. She's a single mum. She's a kind and fair person. She'd give everything and more to give her son a better future. She cares about climate change. She cares about people. And most of all, she cares about her workplace in the NHS. She's really busy and she's always tired. She doesn't just have bags under her eyes. She has suitcases. And she only has 30 minutes every day to watch the TV while she's making her son's breakfast, packing his lunch to go off to nursery, 
And when she turns on the news at 6 a.m. and wakes her son up for school on election day and sees our party political broadcast, why would she be more attracted to archaic legal jargon about electoral reform and attempts to gain parliamentary democracy rather than a Labour Party that will offer class politics, lower energy bills, free childcare, rent caps, and many other things that should be in the firmly in the wheelhouse of any self-respecting party of Labour. Comrades, right now, there's a battle to be won for the heart and soul of the Labour Party. The only party in this country that is a party of the working class with an historic link to the trade union movement. That fight is the single most important thing to restore voters' faith in the third of voters who don't turn up to vote. They all feel that politicians are the same and no one is out there to help their lives. I know certain members of the left took such an attitude towards Brexit and the second referendum that we just need to change the rules. Campaigning for PR is an utterly weak position. We want our friends and family, co-workers, the Claire's in our lives to get behind a mass political project and we need to make a bold and positive case for socialism, not reliance on finding an electoral loophole in doing so, jumping into bed with the most rank opportunists of the British party politics. Why on earth would ex-Labour voters turn back to us if our pitch is, we know we can't win the argument on our own, so we're teaming up with the Lib Dems for a coalition of government you didn't vote for? It's beyond insulting, and in the extreme, the approach is also doomed to fail. If there's one thing, lesson to learn from the last five years, it's that most people in this country can identify and loathe the political lily in Westminster, Brussels, or elsewhere. Almost all of you in this room would have heard someone on the doorstep say they're all the same. How can we honestly rebuke that when we're campaigning for PR, a process that necessitates either a formal or informal coalition with opposing parties, and not intra-left opposition either? It's not factional. In fact, we should all balk at an anti-Tory coalition that <laughs> includes the Lib Dems who fielded ex-Tory MPs against Labour and introduced austerity, or the Greens under Caroline Lucas who scabbed on her own workers here in Brighton and Hove. The cheerleaders of George Osborne's People's Vote racket are not socialists and should be nowhere near socialist government or party. But under PR, we would be bringing charlatans in from the cold to try and find obviously impossible positions of compromise with those whose class interests are diametrically opposed to our own. Friends, if we want to win even moderate social democracy in this country, let alone socialism, we cannot defang neo -Tory, uh, the neo-Tory juggernaut of big spending, big infrastructure and Brexit delivery with a toothless call for help in our hour of need. It's desperate. It looks desperate to the electorate. There are no shortcuts to winning state power. Short of storming the Winter Palaces, of course, if we call ourselves parliamentary socialists, and we should, we need to build socialist power through our CLPs, through our communities, through our workplaces, and most importantly, through our union movement. We cannot merely hop on the coattails of arcane constitutional reform, nor jump into bed with an unworkable coalition of some highly anti-socialist bedfellows. We must create a new world using the old tools. Organizing, organizing, organizing in our party, in our unions, in our workplace, in our social centers, at the school gates, down the pub, queuing at the supermarket. We must win the argument and not accept that we have lost it and ask for handouts for people that will do us in anyway. Just look at the centrist approach to Corbyn over the last half decade. In 2017, we came close. We did so not by changing the rules, not by engaging in all-consuming discussions about constitutional reforms, and not by political chicanery in Westminster. We did it by telling ordinary people we would make their lives better. We would put jobs in their communities, food in their bellies, and money in their pockets. We all know a Claire. We all owe her a Labour government that represents the collective interests of those who work. And fundamentally, comrades, if Luke Akehurst, supporter of the illegal war, Peter Mandelson and PR think something is a good idea, it's probably a bad one. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
So, unfortunately, Howard's not here yet, but I think we do have another speaker who can speak to a probe. I can't see Stuart Hill, but I know we... Oh, my God, you're there. Right there. This is a last-minute standing, but, Stuart, if you would, it would be great. It's a ramp. <laughs> Just if you go around, thank you. Keep going, keep going. Oh. <laughs> This way. <laughs> there you go. Thank it, you it, for it this. was a ramp <laughs> as well, better than steps. Uh, how many minutes? Five. Five minutes. We'll keep keep me right at four. Um, I've been a lifelong supporter of PR. Um, where I live now is uh, in Newcastle. In Tyne and Weir, we have 12 MPs, 12. Every single one of them is Labour. Rock solid Labour. You know, when they talk about red walls, you don't get any redder than Tyne and Weir. And what use is it for having 12 Labour MPs when we have a rock solid Tory government? <laughs> it seems to me that the, the arguments of those people who are in favour of first past the post is that they do still live I don't know really, I suppose, they, they don't live in the 1970s even, but they've got a, a kind of a wish fulfillment that 1945 will come back and there will be a huge Labour majority and it'll be a radical reforming one. And it's as if Labour in Scotland has been annihilated. Labour in Scotland, under first past the post, lost... 40 MPs overnight, and it's not got them back. It shows no sign of getting them back. And I'm afraid that those people who support First Past the Post, you didn't hear any mention, did you, of Scotland and the effect, the change in political realities in Scotland as if it doesn't affect anything in the United Kingdom. There was really no mention either of Wales. What a terrible thing in Wales. They've actually got a Labour government developing proper progressive policies. How were they elected? God help me, it was PR, yeah? <laughs> and, and you know, it, it's like, you know, I, I, think, I think there are, there's issues of uh, argument uh, in terms of, um, how to put it, uh, people, people say, it's, it's, it's an issue in time and way to say, why should we lose Labour MPs? For them buggers down south and all those other places where they can hardly elect any. Yeah, and in any way, who's going to be the main beneficiary of a PR system? Lib Dems. You know, you look at the statistics, and of course, the Lib Dems would take seats overwhelmingly from Tories. And you know, when you ask the question, you ask the question, what is the most vital thing and the most credible thing, the most urgent thing? Is it that we want a radical reforming Labour government at this point in time with this Labour leadership that we've got Come on, get real. Or is our number one priority that we want to see the end of these dreadful, getting worse all the time, Tory governments? Now, my priority, I mean, I want to see a radical reform in Labour government. Of course I do. I'm still in the bloody Labour Party. I'm an optimist, aren't I? You have, you have to be. You have to be. How long have I got left? 
a minute. Uh, so, so the important thing, really, is uh, what I'm saying is, is that, and whatever you do, you know, sort of, and whatever your point of view that you came to with, uh, in terms of this discussion, is obviously, listen, listen to the points that all the speakers have been made, and basically say, well, look, you observe reality yourselves, and you say, who is it that's actually putting forward points of view that are going to provide the policy, po the possibility of more progressive governments, not, I mean, not just at the next general election, you know, that's a kind of short-termism. Short -termism. If you think about how those governments in uh, the Scandinavian countries which are overwhelmingly, in all sorts of ways, you look at how socially progressive on issues of egalitarianism, and all, egalitarianism, all the kind of things that are precious to our hearts, and you just say, well, what, what, what's, what's the most important thing? And overwhelmingly for me, it's ending these fucking Tory governments. All right, thank you. Thanks for stepping in. <laughs> Can I just ask everyone, a little bit of audience participation now, because I'm quite interested to know how many people had already decided whether they were pro or against before we started? Okay, so very opinionated bunch, great, fantastic. Um, can I have uh, questions? Weather roaming mics? I have a lady at the front here and a man with the specs in the middle there. And we'll, there's a man at the front here. And this, can I have a lady with the red T-shirt there, please? Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of, Pamela Trevithick from Bristol. There's been a lot of discussion about the landslide that happened after the war. But I want to remind colleagues and brothers and sisters that it was during the war that Attlee learnt the art of uh, politics as a member of a coalition. When the coalition ended and the Labour Party took office, they did so also on the basis of a coalition. Ernest Bevin was a member of the Liberal Party. Maynard Keynes, the great economist, who went to the United States to argue for the Marshall Plan that actually funded the NHS at the beginning of its life, Maynard Keynes was a Liberal. They worked in the Labour Party as Liberals. The initial Labour Party of this country had a Liberal coalition. I'm really despairing about how political, other political parties are described in this room, as if they're evil people. They are not evil people. They may have different views, and they may have taken really weird and, want, and disdainful routes Thinking about, yeah, austerity, agreed. I can take that on board, of course. I'm not wanting, I'm not saying here to, uh, to listen, I'm not going to justify austerity, nor am I justifying the, the, the increase in poverty to suggest that people who want proportional representation don't want the best for everybody in this country. It's downright unfair and don't do it. It's morally wrong to present people who have a wrong, a different idea to you as if they're somehow evil. But the point I want to make is the basis on which a coalition needs to be formed is the basis of politics. It's politics. It's what the different political parties hold in terms of housing, poverty, in uh, every aspect of, the, of this country. We, it is about getting the right policies and we cannot even think about changing the massive mistakes that this incredibly corrupt government have made without thinking about aligning ourselves with others, as did Bevan when he set up the NHS. He was actually negotiating with people who absolutely bloody hated him, but he could still negotiate to the point that he could get an NHS because the biggest issue for Bevan at that time was the NHS, not how he felt about it. And finally, I want you to remind you what kind of politics we've now got under Mr. Starmer. I asked David Evans yesterday, how many people are currently suspended? He said, oh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. 
I said, well, could you just give me a figure? And I did this, I didn't this, do this as an attacking person, as a questioning person. And he said, well, I think probably about 30. That is absolutely astounding. We are in a party that keeps suspending people when they hear something they don't like. That cannot be called socialism. This leader cannot take us to socialism. He's taking us to private enterprise on a, on a different ticket. There's a ramp. You don't have to jump, Howard. It's that way. <laughs> Hi, um, I was actually undecided. I'm still undecided, but um, I just wanted to pick up on a few points. Um, I think you mentioned that lots of questions that are asked are about um, they're all the same, all the comments. But actually, the comments I see in my constituency of Epsom and Yule has uh, uh, an MP that took away books from prisoners and signed a £50 million Brexit ferry contract with a company that didn't have any boats, and we still can't get rid of him. Um, they actually say it, ne it will never change. We, can, we can't elect anyone else. So actually, would changing the system actually encourage people to come out and be part of this political process? Currently, we have wards in um, our constituency that vote Labour um, in, at a council level, but actually they don't turn out to vote Labour at a general election because they, things, they think things won't um, change. And um, the other point that Jacob made was that actually we go into the next election with an electoral pact with the SNP, the Greens and Lib Dem saying, OK, we want to change the electoral system. Well, actually, no. We will be going into um, that election with the fact that we will do anything to get rid of these Tories. And in that way, we will change. Uh, we will be able to tackle the climate crisis and we will be able to change um, and come out of this pandemic in a, in a stronger way. Thank you. We've got the woman in the scarf and the man in the front row. Hi. Sorry, I'm not used to public speaking in a long time. Um, yeah, I came, I'm in two minds. Um, and I guess I've got more, I, I'll tell you where I'm coming from first of all. I live in a very, sorry, in a very Tory borough in um, Woking, Surrey. Probably the worst MP I could think of, called Jonathan Lord. Um, Having said that, I'm a member of the Labour Party and not, not feeling it's good times. Um, and I suppose P, PR sounds attractive to me because potentially we could, certainly on the council, we, we kind of have Lib Dems and Labour voting together. So that sounds attractive. But um, the but is, and I suppose it's coming back to some of the arguments about PR and Scandinavia, um, and Germany, and I think you mentioned Denmark. Um, I've been reading a book recently about climate change and fossil fuels, and I was quite shocked by the politics of the Scandinavians, um, and in the sense that you can probably see from my age, they were <laughs> seen as the progressive social democrats. I'm afraid that is far from the case these days. Um, the book suggests that what they're doing is, if you're white and Danish or Scandinavian, we'll look after you. We'll, we'll preserve our social benefits. The attacks on immigrants are, they're not good in this country. They're even worse, I would suggest, in parts of Scandinavia. So they are uh, what, what we call center-left, Coalition, they're all coalition governments as speak. So I, I guess I'm coming back to speakers who hold up Scandinavia as progressive, um, progressive societies because whatever there was there, and I'll, I'll, if anyone wants to read the book, it's called uh, White Skin Black Fuels, and it's about the alliances of fossil fuel companies and the far right in Northern Europe. Thank you. I will take one more comment before introducing our panellists. Uh, hi, my name's Elaine Bewley. I'm the political officer for Brighton CLP. I'm speaking in a personal capacity, uh, not in my role. Uh, we have Caroline Lucas as our MP. 
Um, so obviously that's quite complicated for us and uh, creates a lot of debate. Um, before I get on to my central point, I'd just like to take up one of the points that the representative uh, for uh, Campaign for Local Party Democracy made, which is that coalitions uh, often come together and then cobble together a kind of manifesto out of uh, the group that comes together to form that manifesto that is often not one that's been negotiated with the uh, general population. Uh, uh, as they've gone to, uh, as they've gone into that election, and I'd just like to point out that that actually ha already happens in part first past the post in our country because we've had numerous uh, Tory parties campaign on manifestos which they promptly get put in the bin, and that also happened when we saw um, uh, well just the recent uh, recent um, manifestation of the Tories. So I think that we already, we already live with that quite graphically. Now, I think one of the things one has to bear in mind about proportional representation is it's complicated. It is not a straightforward path. It is not a linear development. It is not if we do A plus B plus C, it equals this. It is, it is, it is, it is complicated in the sense that, on the one hand, I think the Labour Party has to get very clear about what it's for. Uh, what is its contract with the people of this country? Is it just to win at any cost? Is, is it to actually have a contract with people of this country that we will hear their voices and we will represent all the voices of this country? Or is it power at any cost and first past the post? Is it... Um, uh, one of the things I think we need to bear in mind, sorry, I've just lost my thread. Um, I think we need to, uh, yeah, sorry, I will wind this up fairly quickly. One of the other, so I think we need to think about what kind of contract we want. And I think triangulation doesn't work because lots of people's voices are not heard. So I don't think that's a particularly great way forward. And I think if we're going to create a consensus for PR, it has to come up through grassroots. We have to build it across the country. And I think just to finish with, so that's huge, and I think we really need to put a lot of effort into that. But the other, the other aspect of this is the real politic of how the numbers and the stats uh, uh, come together, because we have lost Scotland. We, we, if you look at how are we going to win an election without Scot Scottish MPs, we look at uh, the rising uh, growth of independence in Wales, we have some really serious thinking to do about how, how are we going to do it? We're not going to do it through triangulation. We're not going to be doing, uh, we're not going to be creating excitement by concentrating on the marginals. We're going to create excitement and groundswell for voting unanimously, even if it's first past the post, let alone a PR. We're not going to do any of that if we don't build from grassroots up and really excite people about what we stand for, are we hearing their voices, and are we going to actually represent them? Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before I introduce Howard, can I just put it back out to everybody here? We're going to take more comments and responses from the panel. Um, if you haven't had a chance, if you're not used to public speaking and asking questions, please just have a go. Like, four years ago, I had never sat on a panel or chaired anything before in my life, and I was absolutely terrified. And I, honestly, just please, please, please have a go, especially if you're a woman, and especially, especially if you're a woman, woman of colour. Please put your, like, stand up. I will see you from here. Um, before we take more questions, I would like to introduce Howard Beckett, who is the Assistant General Secretary of Unite, who is here on a personal capacity today. Howard, would you like a mic? Although I know you union folks don't need mics I'll to make thundering mic. speeches. I'll take, I'll, I'll take a mic. And apologies that I'm late. And listen, great to see everybody and to feel the warmth and solidarity of everybody just to be at events like this. I feel like I could go around conference just hugging people. It's wonderful. So great to see all of you. Uh, great to see us coming together. And uh, I suppose if, before I get on to proportional representation, which I could talk for a year about, uh, because I do feel passionately about it, and I hate the fact that it's thought of as an anorak debate, when in fact I think uh, electoral reform is one of the most important issues of society. Before I get on to that, can I just give one simple message for this week, and that is, tell Starmer what we think of him. Please, everybody, tell him what we think of him. Uh, there's a, there is a... 
There is, um, there is a rally, a People's Assembly rally in the first weekend of October up in Manchester uh, called Get Tories Out. And those Tories seem to be everywhere at the moment. So let's get them out and let's start this week by getting them out. Um, listen, uh, uh, if I could just say on proportional representation, I, I, I haven't heard the other contributions, so my apologies. And I don't want to sort of repeat the contributions that have been made. But let's start on the premise of democracy and the importance of winning the argument. And that is that we need an electoral system that is fair. And let's look at what this electoral system has given us. Uh, it's given us decades of neoliberalism, decades of attack on the working class. If you're in a trade union, and obviously I'm passionate about everybody being in a trade union, it has given nothing for workers' rights. It has just diminished workers' rights again and again and again. And if Corbyn had got in, well, frankly, obviously, society had to change, but it had to change systemically. Because if Corbyn had got in and lost the next election, then everything that we'd achieve would have just been reversed out. That's the nature of first past the post. So for me, we start from a democratic issue, but we also start as trade unionists and socialists of asking ourselves, what has this electoral system achieved? We frankly have the most right-wing government that we could imagine possible. If they were in France, they would be talked of as if they were a national front party. That is what we have right here and now, the normalization of racism in society. You know, I personally, at this moment in time, am suspended from the Labour Party, quite unbelievably, for attacking Priti Patel. Priti Patel, who is, is implementing racist policies in our society in the name of the establishment. But that's where we have moved to on the first past the post. We've moved to a situation where systemic and institutionalized racism is normalized. We've moved to this situation where people can talk about hostile environments, talk of refugees in a disparaging manner, talk about swarms of migrants, talk about the fact that there is disgust about people having to come across the channel, the people who are fleeing wars that we have created that don't attack Iraq under first past the post. That's how passionately I feel about this electoral system, having created this society that, frankly, I don't want to hand over to my children. But let's think for a second about what first past the post has also created for socialism, because it's created this Labour Party. First past the post has created the Labour Party that we have right now, that is failing all of us in respect of socialism. And look at where it's gone to, because whenever you talk about the electoral system in Scotland, you've got to think about that electoral system in Scotland within the mindset of the Labour Party. Because the Labour Party were still playing their games of first past the post. They were still putting people up in constituencies, expecting that provided they had a red rosette, they would be elected because Scotland had always been Labour. Well, guess what? They stopped representing communities. Under that electoral system, that mindset, they stopped representing communities, stopped talking for class issues. And what happened? The SNP came in. And whether or not you believe that the SNP is a party of socialism or a party of nationalism doesn't matter. It was a party that provided an alternative. And the reason why it provided an alternative that was successful was because this Labour Party stopped listening to working class communities and stopped representing them. And that's because of the first past the post system. And we are now seeing it in the north of England and in the Midlands as the Labour Party moves down to be an eccentric Labour Party of London. We are seeing that they are stopping representing people. And people who say that proportional representation is not a class issue, I reject that. It is a class issue. And it is a class issue because it's an electoral system that demands that people from communities step forward to be the representatives of those communities. It isn't a waste of time talking about it. It isn't a denial of socialism. It isn't moving away from class issues. It is systemic to our belief that we need working class people to represent working class people. Um, I will, I'll wind up. And if, I, if I could just wind up with, with one final thought in respect of proportional representation, and that is to please ask everybody not to think about it in isolation. We have to talk about electoral reform. Your contribution, fantastic. And where you're going to is an argument over federalism. What is electoral reform? What is regionalization? How can we give power to communities that they can change their own lives? What has the mayoral system achieved? Where will assemblies go to? Vitally, when will will we have an argument for votes for 16-year-olds, stop discriminating against them in respect of the minimum wage, and absolutely fundamental to this. Please, think about private education as a class issue, not a privilege of entitlement. It has to be changed. We cannot have a society 
to constantly represent us through the elite. And that is what private education has achieved. And I, I felt it whenever I came to, from Northern Ireland to England. I couldn't believe the sectarianism of private education. It was much more apparent to me than the sectarianism of religion in Northern Ireland. That's how bad. So please just think about electoral reform as one picture, proportional representation, part of it. But let's be revolutionary in respect of what we ask for in change in society. Thank you, Solidarity. Thank you. Would any of Sasha or Jake like to respond to the audience or tomorrow? Yeah, thanks. Um, so it's a really interesting argument that's been put forward. I think, I suppose, the overarching thing that I want to emphasise is that it's the politics that matters. The reason that we have a Tory government in this country is not because of the electoral system. It's because the Labour movement has been smashed and it's because we have lost the political arguments, right? That is why we have a Tory government. The reason they have a Labour government in Wales is because they have a decent Welsh Labour party that stands up for people and shows how they can improve people's lives. And the reason that, Scotland, uh, that the Labour party in Scotland lost under first past the post is not because of the electoral system, it's because they were terrible at politics. They didn't stand up for people and they got into bed with the Tories um, during that referendum. It's the politics that matters. You know, neoliberalism has happened in this country, yes. It's also happened all over Europe as well, where they have proportional representation systems. It's the politics that matters, and that is what we should focus on, not the electoral system. Yeah, I have to say, I'd agree. You know, all these things happened under a blue sky. Are we going to campaign to get rid of the blue sky? It's like saying, I've got a cold, so I'm going to take some jelly beans for it. For me, that feels like a ridiculous argument. And to say that uh, electoral reform is going to be a panacea to all our ills, actually, if... Uh, previous campaigns have proven anything, this kind of campaign takes away from what we should be talking about and what we should be doing. While we're going out there saying we want to change the rules on the electoral system, we're not going out there and saying we want to put money in your pocket and food on your table. That's the important thing. How many people here are in a trade union? How many people here turn up to their branch meetings and talk to people, people who don't vote Labour, Hardly any of them will say, I don't vote or I don't vote Labour because it's stitched up anyway. Most of them will say, all politicians, all politicians believe the same thing and they all are in it for themselves. The doors I've knocked on up and down the country consistently say they all believe in the same thing and they're only in it for themselves. Like we've said before, if we create a system where all politicians do have to make pacts with each other to you know, bring in um, austerity, etc., how are we going to win their trust back again? How many people here remember austerity for the, from the Lib Dems and will, uh, would never vote Lib Dem who might have considered it in the past because that memory lasts a long time? Look, I have a huge a lot of sympathy, a huge a lot. God, I really, it is early and it's Sunday. I, I did get here on time though, Howard, yeah? Um, I have a lot of sympathy with a lot of those arguments, but I just don't think we can divorce the democratic system, which is the underpinnings of our politics from the politics we want. They are two sides of the same coin. We will not have climate justice if we don't get the Tories out and for some significant amount of time. So it's not just about the fact that the first past the post is tipped against progressive forces. It's that when we do get in, we don't get to stay in for very long. And we, nobody's suggesting that we're going to kind of PR tomorrow and then so, you know, heaven the day after. There are no shortcuts. I agree with both of your points on that. We've got to radically reform the party, the party. I mean, you know, that's the other problem, the party. We only even talk about one bloody party because of our ridiculous system. I mean, I, you know, I... There is nothing on earth would have persuaded me not to swap Kate Hoey for pretty much just about bloody anybody. Anti-abortion, pro-fox hunting, took the whip of the DUP in a safe seat, stuck in it forever, and none of us could do anything about it. And, and you know, I've talked to my young colleagues from the campaign who were really visceral hatred of the Liberal Democrats because of what they did on tuition fees. We get that. I also remember voting Lib Dem tactically... And you know what? It wasn't that hard, because at the time they wanted a penny on the pound for education, and they didn't want to bomb Iraq. So we must stop deluding ourselves. 
that the Labour Party has a prerogative over all that is progressive. It is just not true. History tells us the opposite. We are not saying that, you know, we want to give away our radical intent. Quite the contrary. Can you imagine what it would be like if the left were actually able to really argue its case, if we weren't squeezed in the way that we are in the Labour Party, if we weren't having to chase after that marginal voter, which means we're waving the bloody flag all the time at the moment, rather than actually setting out visionary and transformational politics. I believe it would give us a greater chance of a radical politics if we, if we shook up the voting system. And I just return to the basic point that if the Tories want to extend first past the post, we have to examine why. They know it's good for them. They know it works for them. They know it keeps them in power. They know it drags us rightwards. And we know that under first past the post, all of the extremists, and I agree with everything you said about extremists in politics, both of you, obviously, they're in government. They are in the government that we have now. We are not protecting ourselves against extremism by having first past the post, quite the contrary. It was UKIP and the far right and Farage who got us the government that we're now stuck with. So, you know, but, but really, I guess in the end, the biggest thing is Howard's first starting point. We have got to be democratic socialists. And we can't ignore the democratic bit of that. And at the moment, millions of people do not count. They can vote and it makes no difference. What does that do to how you feel about agency in your life? What does that do to how you feel about the campaigns that you should be mounting? You know, if nothing else, if only that point, we have to put the democratic back in democratic socialism, and this should be core business for the Labour Party. This isn't a nice to have, it's an absolutely fundamental part of what we should be about. Thanks. I I'm being eyed from the other side, and I can't resist someone who has shares my name, so off you go. <laughs> I'm going to be really cheeky, and this is because this is every trade unionist dream to get to grill their ex-boss a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, fair play. You want to put the democratic back in socialism. I want to put the socialism back in socialism. It's all about wielding state power, and we will never do that if we have to go into coalitions with people who don't want us to have state power. And that is the key point here, people. Do we want a radical transformational government, or do we want everyone to have a bit more of a say? Because you know what? Under... PR, we would be giving more of a say to the people like Nigel Farage and worse. The electoral route to fascism in this country has been crushed. The Democratic Footballer Lads Alliance was the last attempt they had and it failed. And why did it fail? Because our electoral system says no to that. My dad lived under Franco for 20 years. Fascism is a very real threat. It's a very real threat on the continent. I'm quite surprised to see Laura Parker arguing this when she lives in Italy. She knows that Salvini came to power under this threat, and she knows that uh, through all of this, they had to make pacts with people that wanted to see a return to horrible fascist politics. And we don't have that problem in this country. We have far more of a strong voice. It may not feel like it right now, but we do have far more of a strong voice in our party and working together with our party. Every projection I've seen for PR works on the parties we have. It doesn't take into consideration. Actually, there'll be a multitude of parties and it will give a voice to people. Our media isn't going to go, oh, let's give some left-wing groups a bit of a shout. No, our media is obviously going to prioritise giving the very worst in this country an opportunity to air their racist, fascist views. Do we want a system like that? I don't think so. Okay, back to the floor for comments. Um, there's, a young per there's a young person out there, apparently. We're not all oldies. Don't forget, as many women as possible as well, I promise you. Um, I was really scared of speaking up at these things, and now I get to manhandle the mic off Howard Beckett. <laughs> so, uh, there's, I can see a lady there. And any more You have to wave at me, because I can't see from here. Lady, and... Another one at the back, please. And then, is this the young person you're telling? <laughs> Are you young? We l yes, young, young person over there. And, oh, Paul, go on then. Um, 
No, um, yeah, I'd just like to make a really uh, simple sort of say something really simple, which is that when people are talking, like they're saying, oh, Caroline Lucas did this. So, I mean, I don't know what it was that someone mentioned, but, you know, a lot of people um, want to, are between Labour and, and Green. And, and I think it's about recognising what other people have to offer us. Well, I know there's, like, the extreme... You know, I'm not saying, like, you know, we want a lot of the extreme right thing people. We don't. But... You know, like, for instance, we wouldn't be talking about climate change like this in the Labour Party if the Greens hadn't started talking about it. And it never gets recognised by anyone when they say that. And so I think we can, you know, there's benefit. we would benefit with the Greens, whether we agree with everything they say. I mean, I don't agree with a lot of what goes on in the Labour Party, what people say. I agree with lots of things as well. So I think, you know, it's about opening ourselves up because when we've got this idea that... There's, there's like them and us, and that's what's happening in, in English or, or, you know, uh, UK society or whatever. That's how we think here, and and I think the idea of thinking a bit differently about it, that you can work with people, and we're going to gain from understanding other points of view as well, just needs to come into it a bit because we're not getting anywhere the way it's going. You know, it's getting worse and worse, and we've got Keir Starmer and all the rest of it. You know. Hi, thank you. Um, so I've heard a lot of people argue about the kind of, when we think of typical canvassing experiences and doorstepping with kind of classic Labour voters or as we're talking to people in the public. And I think that the idea that um, people perhaps can't comprehend PR or can't understand why it's such a priority is quite infantilising and quite demeaning in a way. I think um, the fundamental lack of democracy in this country is really easy to understand for anybody. And I think a lot of people on the doorstep actually care a lot about that. And they can relate first past the post to why they're struggling with austerity, poverty, low income, um, what they're seeing in the right wing media, why there's constant um, negative racist rhetoric, transphobic rhetoric, um, bigot bigoted rhetoric, they can draw those two um, conclusions. You know, as you said, they're both the same sides of the same coin. Um, and I also think PR would be a great investment into our future because I understand that I take extremely seriously the risk of fas fascism, as we all do. However, time is moving, time is shifting, moving on. And I believe this younger generation, especially if we do get the 16-year-olds voting, which I really hope we should, no taxation without representation. The younger generation, I can't see us ever going fascist. I can't, as we move up and as we understand how we've been treated and, and as we pass on to generations below us, our uh, morals and morality, um, Barry Sherman voice, um, I, can't, I can't see it becoming as big of a threat as it, as it is now. So I think that electoral reform would be a fantastic investment in the future of our democracy, as well as the present. Thanks. So I have a question for Jake. So I, I think you started with a fictional example from Denmark. And when I look at the first-past-the-post countries around the world, there's basically three big, rich first-past-the-post countries, us, the US, and Canada. Uh, in the US, in Congress, there's, what, like five socialists? Um, in Canada, they just had an election where the new Democrats, who are kind of on the left, got 18% of the vote and only 7% of seats. Um, and actually, I think social democracy and Labour parties are in decline around the world. But under first-past-the-post systems, we're absolutely locked into those parties that are on the way out. Whereas in PR systems, there is actually an opportunity for an alternative to emerge. And if we look at like uh, the left bloc in Portugal, the movement for socialism in Bolivia, uh, Podemos in Spain, um, actually PR systems allow for a much more uh, kind of dynamic and um, pluralistic left politics. Um, so we in the Labour Party, socialists in the Labour Party, have to ask ourselves, do we really want to be on Keir Starmer's sinking ship or do we want a politics which actually allows for 
some kind of transformational new, new politics to emerge. Uh, my, my actual question for you is, where in the world has your strategy of uh, a left party winning on a minority of the vote and somehow getting a majority and enacting socialism which lasts, which isn't just repealed by a right-wing government when they inevitably get a majority a few years later. Where has that actually happened? I'm going to take Paul and then we'll come to you two. Thank, thank you, Chair. I mean, um, the first thing I want to say is that if we do get PR, I don't want to, want to be on a list drawn up by David Evans because none of us will be on it. Uh, and so the last speaker's point is absolutely right. I think it yeah. will lead to a fragmentation of left politics. But I do support PR for this reason. Climate change places a ticking clock into the scenario of socialism. It's the first issue that we have to, of all the issues we fight for, that, that, that we have to meet a time limit. Now, the problem we face, the real world problem, is that we have a minority of racists, xenophobes, climate skeptics, um, you, imperialists, colonialists, Islamophobes in this country. They're a minority. Some of them, as you say, are a dangerous minority. But they have a permanent government. They are represented permanently by a Tory party that can govern forever if we don't stop them. And the reason for that is not just the, the, the electoral system. It is what other people said before you arrived, Howard, the media. It's the structure of politics. But the one thing we could do, the one thing we could do is this. This is a second difference between 1945. The progressive majority in this country is already dis distributed beyond several parties. If you look at places like Stroud, Bristol, Sheffield, the people who are voting Green, putting Green councillors into what? Coalition uh, administrations with Labour are not, are not terrible people. They, they've got their own bureaucracy, their own career structure, their own beliefs. They will not go away. And above all, they won't go away in Scotland. I don't think we can govern alone anymore. And even if we could, even if we could, comrades, I wouldn't want to govern Scotland as a kind of colonial, uh, kind of Labour colonialism, you know, with one of our few MPs as the Scottish Secretary. I want a Labour SNP government because I know it will transform Britain and I know it will do one thing. Yes, despite the, the, the Cumbo field and all the backsliding of Nicola Sturgeon, it will be under pressure to begin radical climate action. And surely that is the thing that we need. A government that delivers radical climate action can then mobilise the resources for all the other things we want. The transformative investment programmes, the greening of the energy system, and, yes, social justice. I think, just to finish, I know, yes, yes we'll have to end up in a coalition government. I think by 2022-23, we'll be on, in that discussion with the Lib Dems and the SNP, and they'll ask for PR. But let's remember, we're already in a coalition with scabs, strike breakers, and war criminals, I'm afraid, and it's called the Labour Party. OK, I've got... I'm going to let Jake and Sasha respond, and then there is a lady in the front row and a lady, one, two, three, four, in the middle there. So if you could take after we've had a response. Okay, so... Hang on a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, 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 I'll just give it to you. Oh, sorry. So Paul's right, Paul's right. The Labour Party is a coalition, and coalitions will either happen before, like in First Past the Post, you assemble a coalition... Sorry? You assemble a coalition beforehand, or in, in PR, you assemble a coalition afterhand. Politics is, is about coalition, so it will happen you know, either way. And First Past the Post... Well, we, we do it under Labour at the moment, and I think it still, it still can work for us. To answer the uh, question from the, from the gentleman over there, I suppose I, just, I would put the question back to you. Where has uh, a PR system led to a socialist society and a flourishing socialist government? Scandinavia. So, Scandinavia. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call Scandinavia a socialist society or socialist government. Um, I, think, I think basically the, the, the main issue... I'm getting here, Chair. Yeah. Keep it comradely, folks. Come on. Okay, so I, and lastly, uh, I would just emphasise um, that we have locked uh, the far right out of political representation in Parliament, and we have locked the far right out of government. The, the Tory party are a lot of things. They're not, they're not fascists, right? And what they... The Tory party are not fascists. But if we went, if we went to an electoral system, you would see fascism rise very, very quickly. And I would just remind people what country we're in. Fascism would, would rise very, very quickly. So thank you.
Okay, I know there's going to be loads of people that need to say, so I'm going to go to this lady in the front row, we have another lady, and then there's a, a man. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I want to put some other things into this debate. I read the ABC of Socialism, and Raymond Williams used to say, I'm a democratic socialist, big D, small s. I think it's really important that we're democratic and we remember that even if we win an election on the first bus of post, we have to listen to people, we have to get them involved in the politics and making the policy. I, I changed my mind after I stood in Bristol West in 1987, I'm so old. Um, and um, before that, I supported um, the, the fact that we had Tony Benn in Bristol and he was against electoral reform. I changed my mind because Labour did nothing to go into St Paul's where the riots were, to listen to the people, to find out about them. They asked all the activists in Bristol West to go and fight in other seats that we didn't win. We only had one seat in the whole of the southwest of England. And that is the lesson of First Past the Post. I joined the Labour campaign for, uh, for Labour Party democracy. Okay? I left it because it was undemocratic and it had this policy. And what I'd like to say now is that I am sure if Tony Benn had been in this crowd today, listening to people, listening to Howard, to Laura, to Stuart, to Paul, even to me, Tony Benn would have changed his mind. Okay. We have two, got a lady in the middle row and a uh, man in one, two, three, four, five, six down in black for the lady in the middle, middle row and then the man in black. That one is just there. It, I, I think it's all gone to it, don't Hi, um, I would describe myself as a democratic socialist. Um, I was really inspired by um, Jeremy Corbyn in the last election, which is why I joined the Labour Party. Um, and I am still in the Labour Party, just about, um, and I will continue to fight for radical socialist policies. However, um, I, I don't think, I think anybody who thinks we can get there through first past the post is in cloud cuckoo land, I'm afraid. I don't think Labour are ever going to win the majority vote again. I think we have to look forward and support electoral reform. I, I, in the last election, 45% of the population, um, sorry, the Tory party, got 45% of the vote. Um, and looking at the statistics, the um, progressive groups, so include Labour, I suppose you could call Lib Dem, uh, <laughs> Greens and the Scottish National Party exceeded that 45%. So the majority of the country wanted a progressive government, progressive policies. We're only going to get those progressive socialist policies and left-leaning coalitions, you know, moving forward with electoral reform. And just to come back to Sasha's point, I don't think it's an either or, or scenario. I think we can go on the doorstep. We can, we can fight and argue for, you know, for social justice, for jobs, for protecting our NHS. And we can also support electoral reform. It's not an either or situation. Okay. There's a man behind you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, the, the word democracy has been used again and again in this discussion this morning, and there is an enormous democratic deficit in this country, but it's not, it's not where the advocates of PR say it is. I'll, I'm going to give two examples. One is the vast majority of people in this country and actually, in some polls, even a majority of Tory voters say they want more nationalisation, they want more taxes on the rich, and they want an economy which works for everyone, including working class people, not just the top 1%. That position, which is the majority position of people in the UK, 
on the key issue is not represented in the leadership of a single party in Parliament. We've just come out of a brief period when the Labour Party did represent that position and there was a huge rush of votes towards the Labour Party in 2017 for that reason. Is PR going to solve that problem? It's not going to change the leadership of any of the political parties we have because of the balance of forces, the nature of capitalism, the media and the establishment. Political struggle in the trade unions, in our workplaces and in the Labour Party is needed to give people a voice on the key issue that they have today, not to create a multiplicity of political parties, all of which basically represent different strands of capitalism. Second democratic deficit, Howard is suspended from the Labour Party. I'm suspended from the Labour Party. I was suspended to be in order that I would be blocked from standing as councillor again and to assist the process whereby London Region and our local right wing and some people who were elected on a left wing ticket but soon changed their minds overthrew the leadership of Haringey Council and two, two of us councillors were suspended to help that happen. PR is not going to change that. Our struggle in the Labour Party and the Labour movement is going to change that. One last point on an electoral pact to get there. Voters are not chess pieces, they are not soldiers. I'm sorry, I'm not voting Lib Dem. I'm not voting Lib Dem if it's part of an electoral pact. And a huge number of Labour voters won't vote, vote Lib Dem. Unfortunately, a large number of Lib Dem voters won't vote Labour. An electoral pact to get PR will be less than the sum of its parts and just guarantee another victory by the Tory party. PR is similar, this is my last point, PR is similar to the People's Vote campaign in that it will never get you what it says on the tin. It will just result in further defeats for the working class movement. My route, my route to power is political struggle in our workplace, in the Labour Party and okay, in the trade hang on. unions. I'm going to take one more and then we're actually going to go back to the panel to sum up. So there's a man right at the end with a red bandana, please. Sorry, I didn't see. We're, um, I'm going back to the panel to sum up. I'm ever so sorry. Hello. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I've been voting for 50 years under first past the post for Labour, campaigning, organising, doing everything. I'm a bit depressed about the outcome of that 50 years work effort up to, in the last 50 years uh, electoral system. <laughs> it's not much of a legacy to leave behind. But I do want to just come back on three quick points. In Dagenham, the fascists got into the council under first past the post. A few years later, they went out under first past the post. It's not first past the post which is significant here, nor is it Margaret Hodge, the MP who says it was all down to her. What it was, was all of those of us from around London and the area who were stepping over to, to Dagenham, knocking on doors, putting leaflets into literally every single house in that area that beat them politically. They came in and they, they represented something and we beat them politically. So it's not about the, you know, letting in the fascists, right? You beat them politically. The discussion about having an electoral system that gives us the result that we want is the discussion that's been going on in the NEC this last week, where people have been trying to change the electoral system in the Labour Party to get the result that they want. The word fairness hasn't been in there. We should be able to say to people, we well, have a fair voting system. The last point I'll make, I do a lot of stuff with my local momentum group and my local NEU branch on vote, youth, young voter registration. We've done a lot. The biggest, hardest thing about this is that they feel that their votes don't count under the system that we've got now, and they don't make a difference, and they're right. Under PR, immediately their vote begins to make a difference and it has some value. Okay. And I believe that we need to do that. Whether or not it makes it harder for us or easier for us is neither here nor there. The question for socialists is which is the fair way of voting? Thank you, everybody. I am going to now hand back over to our panel. Um, to, we've got about 10 minutes and I'm going to let each one of you um, sum up and respond. 
Thank you. Can I start with a shout out to Anna Rothery, who's joined us at the back of the room, the best socialist mayor that Liverpool never had. Solidarity, Anna, great to see you. And can I just, uh, can I just um, before I get on to the arguments, and I will be brief, I promise, but can I just say to people, please do not be depressed about where we currently are. The right wing are now just ob objectionalists. They are oppositionalists to the left wing. They offer nothing for society. They offer no policies. All they want is power without any determination to bring socialism. And that is why we will win this argument. It was, uh, it was Martin Luther King, obviously, who said that the path to justice is long. Uh, that is true. We we may well not be the generation that sees a socialist government, but we will play our part in achieving it. So please do not be negative right here now, because the path will return to us in respect of socialism. Just to see, just to see, deal with the, the agendas here. We do have a government that is now on its way to fascism. We have the most right-wing government that any of us could have possibly imagined. And just look at Chis and look at the police crime and sentencing bill, where our rights to protest are being, are, are being removed. Look at the way Black Lives Matters has been treated by the establishment. This is what we are fighting against. And to deal with the unfairness of the system, Labour will need, after the boundary changes, an 8% lead in the polls in order to form a majority government. That is how skewed the present system is. And to finally just address the point about whether or not this is revolutionary or whether or not PR is the panacea for, for all of the wrongs in society, it is part of the solution. I want to be part of a socialist party that is knocking on the doors at the next election and saying, yes, we will give you an electoral system that will change your own lives, where you can influence your own communities, where you will have a federal structure. Yes, we are going to give the votes to your children in your house because they are 16, they deserve, because they are taxed, they deserve the right to vote. And yes, we are campaigning now for a society to end elitism, to abolish private education, as so as socialism has a chance and has advocates in society. I want to knock on the door for that Comrades, solidarity. I mean, it's really unfair that you got to lie in more and I have to speak after you. Um, I want to apologize for the fact that I'm constantly being on this thing all the way through. It's not because I'm being rude. It's because um, yesterday we came second in the priority ballot, um, which was an extraordinary achievement. We managed to secure our motion unamended to get onto the floor of conference. And we're now having a little negotiation with the leadership who might like something else. And we're not going to back down. Um, this is the motion on PR. So it's going to be on conference floor tomorrow afternoon. We are actually going to have a debate for the first time in a very, very long time. And the debate is going to say, not some watered down version of where we might like to think about it eventually. Well, perhaps one day we'll have a look at it, maybe once we've done everything else we'd like to do. It's going to say, the Labour Party should make a commitment to proportional representation in its manifesto at the next general election. And if you are a delegate or a friend of a delegate, Make sure they get up tomorrow morning on time, yeah? Make sure they get in there and vote for it. And if you're in CLPD and you're not that convinced about PR, look at the breadth and depth and excitement behind this campaign and ask yourselves, if you believe in party democracy, how you're going to suggest that we ignore the single biggest campaign ask that has been put to the Labour Party in recent history. We have 150 CLPs have put motions in. We have half of all the CLPs in the Labour Party. That's half of all the registered ones. And as some of you know, because you live in safe seats where the Labour Party is pretty much dead, that's probably about 65 or 70 percent of all the constituency Labour parties in the whole of the UK have put forward this motion. So hold your nose and support the membership, because that is what CLPD is supposed to be about. <laughs> In the end, it is about equality. There's masses of evidence about the progressive outcomes for countries where they have PR. They've got higher rates of coverage of trade unionism. They've got less restrictive trade unionist laws. They've got less inequality. They haven't privatized everything that moves and even stuff that doesn't. But ultimately, the Labour Party and the left and socialists, we stand for everyone or we stand for nothing. And under first past the post, you cannot stand for everyone. And millions of people are told they do not count. And when millions of people are told they do not count, apathy 
and disenchantment set in, and they are the friends of the far right. And the way to defeat the far right is to empower the whole electorate, to engage the whole electorate. We have to get rid of this rotten system. It's the Tory status quo, and it is time the Labour Party and the left woke up. Please support the PR motion tomorrow if you're in the conference hall. Well, look, just, just to address the arguments about, you know, the debates on the conference floor, I'm very happy we're having this debate on the conference floor. I'm very happy we're having this debate today. And of course, if it passes conference, then it should be implemented. That's fine. I don't think it will pass. I think the trade unions will not support it because the trade unions set the Labour Party up to achieve a majority Labour government that would govern in their interests and transform the political system for, for working-class people. So I think it will be rejected on that, on that uh, path. Um, I think the reason that people don't vote is not the voting system. I think they are not offered a political platform and program for change. And I think that is the thing that we should focus on as socialists. And I think that um, in order to get to the system of, of PR, we would, have, we would have to enter an electoral pact that would water down our ability to um, uh, put that message across um, and, and try and change people's lives. So I'll just end on that, and thanks very much uh, for coming. Cheers. I'd like to uh, echo a lot of Jake's comments that have been made, and I think in a lot of these uh, summations and debates that we've had today, I've heard a lot about we will get PR through, and then we'll get votes at 16, and I just wonder why it's that way round, and actually shouldn't we be prioritising votes at 16, shouldn't we be prioritising empowering our communities by strengthening uh, the powers that local government have? Those are surely the ways in which we give people a voice. Those are the ways which we give people the opportunity to access their democracy. Um, and I, I'd like to sum up and say that if you are voting tomorrow, the democratic thing to do is vote as your delegation have mandated you to vote, because that is true party democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panellists. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who participated today. On your way out, uh, would you mind kind of moving back quite quickly? Because we have to move all the chairs, apparently. I don't know what's happening in here next, but it's going to be exciting because we need the whole space.